beasts. In Revelation, the 17th chapter, and I'm looking at verse 12, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one hour. All of the suffering, all the pain that they inflict on others through the ages for one hour of glory and then it's gone. One hour. Verse 13, they have one purpose and they will give their power and authority to the beast. The ten kings will give their power and authority to the beast. Why? Verse 14 tells us they will make war against the lamb. What, what chance does he have? A pitiful little innocent lamb against the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies, what chance does he have? But the Bible tells us that the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings and with him the called, chosen, and faithful followers. The lamb will overcome them. The lamb will win I read the back of the book already. I know who's going to win this thing. It doesn't look like it. doesn't seem like he has a chance. But the Bible tells us the Lamb is going to win against the beast, against the kings of the earth, because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's going to win. And with him is called chosen and faithful followers. You want to win? Follow the Lamb. I want you to notice something here. All the kings of the earth join together with the beast. In Revelation chapter 16, he sees in verse 14 unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and their spirits of demons. Verse 14, they perform miracles. They go out to the kings of the whole world. There they are to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Verse 16, then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. That's the last great war. Who do they fight against? We just read it. The ten horns of ten kings who receive authority along with the beast. They have one purpose and they'll give their power and authority to the beast and they'll make war against the Lamb. I want you to notice it does not say they make war against Israel. And that's what the whole world is looking for today. But they are gathered together to make war against the Lamb. And his called, chosen, and faithful followers, that's you. That's all who choose to follow Jesus Christ. The Lamb is Jesus. He will be victorious. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. Well, we know the Lamb is Jesus. But who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Jesus, not who was Jesus? The answer to that question, Revelation, the first chapter, Revelation chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 17, John had just seen a vision. And he saw Jesus in vision. He fell to his feet. He was scared. And so he placed his right hand on him. He said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. He saw Jesus, and Jesus said, I am the first and the last. Now, there are a lot of people who would like for you to believe that that wasn't Jesus speaking. That has to be the Father in heaven. Couldn't have been Jesus. Well, if you read the next verse, 
It shows you it has to be Jesus. It says, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, now I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys to death and Hades. I was dead. Now I am alive. That is not the Father. That is the Son, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the first and the last. Jesus is the Lord God Almighty. In fact, one of my favorite prophecies, Isaiah the 7th chapter, verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Imagine already in the Old Testament, the Bible says, a virgin would conceive, give birth to a child, a son, and his name would be Emmanuel. Now the truth is that Emmanuel is another Hebrew word. Actually, it's three Hebrew words. Im in Hebrew means with. Manu means us. El means God. His name would be Emmanuel. With us, God. Or God with us. A virgin would conceive and give birth to a son so that God could be with us. And we find the remarkable fulfillment to that prophecy in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now the Old Testament says that Jesus, the Messiah, would come to the world so that God could be with us and he would be born of a virgin. The New Testament says he was. I believe that. I believe God that Jesus was born of a virgin. If he wasn't, he couldn't be the Messiah. But watch this. He appears to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now Mary was not very excited about that greeting. She knew all the Old Testament stories about the prophets. The Lord was with them. Look at what happened to them. They were stoned, hung, stuck in hollow logs, sawed in half. She knew about all this. She said, I'm not so sure I want the Lord to be with me like that. I'm not so sure I want to be favored like that. It bothered her. In fact, it even says here in verse 29, she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered, uh-oh, what kind of a greeting is this? Verse 30, the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God, and you'll be with child and give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. What a prophecy. What a promise to Mary. A young lady, a virgin, pledged to be married to Joseph. Wow. Now Mary started thinking about this. And she thought, whoa! 
Didn't you take the class in the birds and the bees? How can this happen? I'm a virgin. Verse 34. And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary. What a woman she must have been. God chose her, handpicked all the women on earth to be the mother of his son. What a woman she must have been. And you know, sometimes I think that as Protestants, we're so afraid of lifting Mary up to a position that's unwarranted the way some do that we almost avoid her altogether. But I believe that there's a real blessing to be had when we understand Mary and a little more about who she was. Engaged to be married to a man. Told that she would be the mother of the Son of God because the Holy Spirit would come upon her. I would think one of the first thoughts to come into her mind was Joseph. How am I going to tell Joseph? Have you ever thought about that? Joseph, I need to tell you something. I'm going to have a baby. What? Oh, no, no, it's not like you think. You see, this angel... Can Now, the thing that really amazes me is Joseph believed her. Does that tell you something about what she must have been like? Joseph believed her. Sure, it took a little help from an angel, but he believed her. <laughs> what a story. So that God could become a man. And be with us. What a God. Unsearchable love. Jesus. Born of God. The Holy Spirit. And born of Mary. Fully God. And fully man. At the same time. What a God. And sometimes I believe that we overemphasize the divinity of Christ you know, we see pictures of Jesus. He has his spotless white robe, hair immaculate, clean, pure. his feet are clean, his, his, his every hair in place, a halo around his head. But I don't believe he was like that. He was a real man. Lived in a desert country. Walked the dusty, hot roads. Feet dirty from the burning sand, robe stained with sweat. He was a carpenter's son. His hands must have been rough and callous from the rough boards that he was working with. Jesus was a man, and he looked so much like a man. Isaiah said, there was nothing about him that men would desire him. If you saw Jesus walking down the desert road with his disciples, there would be no way for you to know that he was the Son of God unless the Father in heaven revealed it to you. He was a man. Fully God, fully man. In fact... Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. No, we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he was without sin. So Jesus became a man, so much of a man, that he was tempted in every way just like you and I. Yet, he was without sin. It doesn't say he didn't sin. That's entirely different. We know he didn't sin. Jesus never sinned. 
But this verse doesn't say he didn't sin. This verse says he was tempted in every way just as you and I, yet he was without sin. Being without sin is something far more profound than simply not sinning. The Bible in the verse we just read said Jesus was born the Holy One. We're not born holy. We're born with a sinful nature. We're born with sinful propensities. We're born with tendencies towards sin. We are born selfish. You don't believe it? Have a baby. <laughs> There's nothing more selfish on earth than a baby. I've never seen one baby that wakes up in the middle of the night hungry with a dirty diaper getting ready to cry and say, oh, no, I don't want to do that. My mom and dad need to sleep tonight. <laughs> We're born self-centered. Jesus wasn't born self-centered. He was born holy. We're not born holy. So how could he be tempted in every way just as you and I? He was without sin. He wasn't born with that sinful nature we have, the tendencies to sin. He was without sin. He was holy. How could he be tempted just like us? We know that when we sin, it weakens us and makes it easier to be tempted and sin the next time. Jesus didn't experience that degradation. He was never hooked on cigarettes, tobacco, alcohol, pornography. So how could he be tempted just like you and I? I think the answer to that question is found in Luke, the third chapter. Back to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River. In verse 22, Jesus came down, and he was baptized too, the Bible says. And when he was baptized, after he prayed, and while he was praying, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Now listen. A voice came down from heaven and said, You are my son, with whom I am well pleased and I love. That was the voice of the Father in heaven. That was the word of God saying, You are my son. Now, Jesus himself was 30 years old when he began his ministry that lasted three and a half years. Chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing. During those days, at the end of them, he was hungry. I believe that. I go four hours and I get hungry. Forty days without eating? Now, I want you to think about something. Jesus was God. Jesus was man. Yet, he was tempted in every way, just like you and I. In order for that to happen, Jesus then would have to cast aside or set aside his divine power and be tempted as a man and not as God. Are you following me? He couldn't use his divine power to withstand temptation. He came to demonstrate that even a human being could, in fact, be obedient to God and keep God's law. He couldn't do it as God. He had to set aside his divine power. And so he goes to the desert as a human being to be tempted and went for 40 days without eating. So what do you think he must have looked like? Must have been pretty weak, pretty frail, skinny. The devil came. He always comes when you're weak and frail and skinny and down. He always comes at your weakest moment. And so the devil came in verse 3 and he said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been tempted to turn stones into bread. Have you? 
And the reason it isn't a temptation to me is because I can't do it. Jesus could have done it if he would have used his divine power instead of withstand the temptation as a man. You see what's happening? He's trying to get him to use his divine power so the devil could say, you see, God, man can't obey you. He could have done it with his divine power, but he had to face that temptation as a man. If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. Now, do you want to know how to withstand temptation? It's simple. With, it is written. But you have to know what's written first before you can say what is written. That's why we need to spend time with our noses in the Word of God. So when the devil comes, you can reply with, it is written. Man doesn't live by bread alone. Pass that test. Verse 5, the devil led him up to a high place and he showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it's been given to me and I can give it to anybody that I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. I have never ever been tempted by a king to worship him if he gives me all the kingdoms of the world. Have you? I never have. So how could he be tempted? in every way just like you and I, yet he was without sin. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So you've got to know what's written. You want to withstand temptation like Jesus did. But there's something deeper going on here. Look at the first one again. The devil said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, turn the stones into bread. You notice the element of doubt? If you are the Son of God. And then he says, worship me, because all authority has been given to me. Can you see what's happening here? What did Jesus look like? He was weak. What did he feel like? He was frail. He had gone 40 days without eating. He was skinny. What did Satan look like? I can promise you he wasn't standing there dressed in that little red jumpsuit, two horns on his head, long tail with an arrow on the end. He always appears masquerade as an angel of light, doesn't he? So here's this dazzling being, an angel of light. And here's this poor, hungry, suffering man who had set his divinity aside and became man. And he's there, hungry, looking like the first wind that comes along is going to blow you away. Worship me. I am the Son of God. You are the fallen angel. Worship me. Now, how did Jesus know that he was the Son of God. He had set his divine power aside. He had to be tempted as a man. He had to learn things just like any other human being, just like you and I. So how did he know he was the Son of God? He had just come from his baptism 40 days earlier, and he heard his Father in heaven say, You are my Son! And I am well pleased. You see, the devil was doing nothing more than simply attempting to get Jesus to doubt God's Word. He was trying to get Jesus to believe what he felt. He didn't feel like a son of God. He was trying to get Jesus to believe what he saw. He didn't look like a son of God. He was trying to get Jesus to believe what he heard. He certainly didn't have a strong voice like a son of God. Instead of believing what God said. And that's how Jesus was tempted 
just like you and I. Because temptation is nothing more than the attempt by the devil to get you to doubt the Word of God. Temptation is nothing more than Satan getting you to doubt that God means exactly what he says in the Word. And no matter if everyone else in the world sees it differently, you want to believe what God says. That's how Jesus was tempted, just like you and I. And that's the kind of man and woman that God is looking for to stand through the end time. To believe the Word of God, no matter what. Verse 9, Then the devil led him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, there he goes again, throw yourself down from here, because, look at this, it is written, He'll command his angels concerning you, guard you carefully, and he'll lift you up in your hand so that they will not, you will not strike your foot against the stone. It is written. Don't be surprised. The devil quotes scripture. He knows it better than you do. It was there as it was written. He saw it unfolding with his own eyes. He knows what's written. He's going to quote it back to you. He did it to Jesus. And how did Jesus answer? I like the way Matthew put it. Jesus answered in verse 12. It is also written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. See, it's not enough to know just what is written. You have to know what is also written. Compare Scripture with Scripture. That's what Jesus did. God is looking for men and women that are willing to believe what the Bible says no matter what anybody else tells them. Some of you have been confronted with a challenge at Revelation now because we dared to dig into the Scripture and talk about some things that most people aren't talking about today. We dared to dig into the Scripture and discover that according to the Bible, the seventh day is a Sabbath day, and God says, I blessed it, I made it holy, I want you to keep it holy. You look around, and practically the whole world is doing something else. Practically the whole world is saying it doesn't matter. But God said it does matter. I made it holy. That means something. Are we prepared to do what God says no matter what everybody else around us is doing? Yes. What a man. Jesus. Hadn't even worked his first miracle yet, but he believed the word of his Father. After this, the Bible set, tells us that Jesus went to a wedding. One day he came home, he saw the male sitting there, a little invitation, all fancy. Who's that, Mom? Oh, that's your cousin in Cana getting married. Oh, good, let's go. He went to the wedding. Now, why do you think Jesus went to the wedding? Why did he go? Weddings are places where people are happy. They're celebrating. They're having fun. I think Jesus went there because he liked to be around people that are happy. He likes to be around people that are celebrating, that are having fun. I think Jesus liked to have fun. He was a human being. I think he enjoyed life. Oh, that's why I don't like all the pictures of Jesus that are always showing him so serious. I think he smiled sometimes. I think he laughed sometimes. I think Jesus was a happy man. He was happy. That's why he went. He worked his first miracle there so they could stay happy. But he was also a brave, courageous man. Tireless, worked all day for the people. And at the end of the day, he's tired, so he says to the disciples, let's get in the boat. We need to go to the other side and take a break. I'm glad he did that. That way I don't have to feel guilty when I feel like I need a break. Jesus took a break. 
So they get in the boat, they row across the Sea of Galilee to the other side, pull it up on the shore, and they're looking around for a place to just rest, kick back a little bit. And suddenly, this man comes running after them, his arms waving in the air, his, his eyes looking like a madman, his hair wild blowing in the wind, he has chains dangling from his wrists and his ankles, he's bearing down on Jesus and the disciples. And, you know, sometimes it's fun to use a little sanctified imagination. See the disciples? Whoa! What's happening here? Maybe run a bit, get back in that boat, row out into the water. <laughs> but when they look back, they see Jesus standing there. He wasn't afraid of this lunatic. He wasn't afraid of this man possessed by a demon. His name was Legion. Jesus was brave. He wasn't scared of the demons. The demons were scared of him. They said, hey, we know who you are. You're the son of God. Get us out of here. Throw us into that herd of pigs over there. And Jesus cast out the demons. And the disciples saw the man sitting there in the sand in his right mind. What a God. Can't you see them quietly rowing that boat back up, not wanting to make any noise, sneaking up behind? Maybe he wouldn't notice that they ran. Jesus was a happy man, but he was bold, courageous, not afraid of anything, not even demons. And then, one of my favorite stories about Jesus. Some of the Pharisees, the highest religious preachers and teachers of the day, the most popular pastors of the biggest churches around, were always trying to trap Jesus. They'd always come to him with some kind of a puzzling question, knowing that there was no good answer, trying to trick him, expose him. But Jesus, I love Jesus, he was the kind of man that could take their question, their attempts to expose him, and with one question, turn it all around and fluster them. This particular time, they had found a woman guilty of adultery. So they dragged her over to Jesus, threw her down at his feet, and said, Moses says we should stone her. What do you say we should do? You see, they had him trapped, no matter how he answered. If he said, well, if Moses said stone her, then stone her. Then they could turn him into the Roman authorities for taking capital punishment into his own hands because it was illegal for a Jew to exercise capital punishment. If he said, let her go, it's illegal, then he could say he doesn't care what Moses said. He doesn't follow the Scripture. He's scared of the Romans. So you see, they had him either way. It didn't matter. Huh. But they weren't prepared for the answer that he gave because at first he didn't say anything. The Bible tells us he just knelt down and began to write with his finger in the sand. And then it tells us that he looked up at him. And one by one, they began to make excuses and left. And then there wasn't anybody left anymore. Just Jesus and the woman. As he's writing in the sand, they're gone. Whew, I got to go get my wife. She's getting off work in a couple of minutes. See you later. Yeah, my kids are about to get out of school. I got to go pick my... They made excuses, the Bible said. They couldn't get out of there fast enough. Nobody's left. Jesus looks at the woman and he said, isn't there anyone here to condemn you? And she said, no. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Did you ever wonder? What did he write in the sand? 
What did he write in the sand? The Bible doesn't tell us. But I think I know. I think I figured it out. You want me to tell you what I think he wrote? No? All right. You want me to? Okay. I'm going to have to put my Bible down. It's not in the Bible. I'm not preaching now. I'm just talking. You don't have to believe this. But here's what I think he wrote. First of all, whatever he wrote, they didn't like. Because they started making excuses to get out of there. Secondly, he said, let the one standing here among you who is without sin cast the first stone. And he started to write some more. And they really didn't like this. And every single one of them cleared out. I think they were, that Jesus was writing a list of their sins in the sand for everybody to see. Remember, he couldn't use his divine power to save himself, but he could use it to save others. And he knew what was in the hearts of those people. I think he was writing their sins down in the sand, and that's why when he said, let the one without sin... If anybody dared to say, he could just, look, it's right there for everybody to see. Oh, I got to get out of here, man. This isn't for me. And furthermore, I'll tell you what else I think. I think that one of those men accusing that woman of adultery was probably the one who committed adultery with her. And why do I think that? Where was the man? Where was the man? He should have brought the man too. He should have been stoned too. Where was the man? I think he was standing there. And I think he was the first one to hightail it out of there when Jesus wrote all this down in the sand. Now, I don't know. When we get to heaven, you can go ask him, was Cologne right about that? The Bible doesn't say. <laughs> Just makes sense to me. What a God, what a man could take this attempt to crush a human life and change it into the opportunity to save a soul. That's the kind of a man that Jesus was. And then when it came time to unmask the Pharisees, the popular pastors, the great preachers of the day, Jesus was the one who was man enough to do it. Matthew 23, some of the some of the toughest words that to come from the mouth of Jesus. Verse 25, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like a whitewashed tomb, which looked beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead man's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness, you snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Whoa. Some pretty straight words, isn't it? But, you know, I sense that when Jesus was saying those words, he had tears in his eyes. Because he loved those Pharisees. He loved those hypocrites. He died for them. I think he must have had tears in his eyes. But yet, he was man enough to stand up to them. And nobody else would. Jesus was a real man. You know, there's some sense of completeness about a man like Jesus who could meet any emergency with steel nerves, cool-headedness like he did, and yet not be so bold and brave and calloused that he was, wasn't ashamed to let a tear stream down the side of his cheek 
at the graveside of a friend. Shortest verse in the Bible. When Jesus went to the graveside of his friend Lazarus and saw his two sisters, Mary and Martha, there at the tomb crying, the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, says Jesus wept. He was so full of compassion and understanding of what it means to be human because he was just like you and I. Tender-hearted, he wept. Tender-hearted, even the children loved Jesus. Disciples one day were there, and the children running up to him, oh, tell us a story. And he, the disciples, shoo, shoo away. He doesn't have time for you. And Jesus said, don't do that. Leave him alone. Let him come here to me. And I love to see pictures of Jesus in my mind, sitting under a tree in the shade in the desert, children sitting on his lap, and Jesus telling them stories about his Father in heaven. You know, adults, we can fool each other sometimes. Did you know that? You can make an adult think you like them when you don't. But you can't fool children. They can see right through it. So the fact that the children loved Jesus meant that they knew he loved them. What a man, tender-hearted man. He had physical needs like we do. One, one morning, the Bible says the disciples had been out fishing all night, and Jesus was there on the beach when they came in. He was fixing breakfast for them because he knew they'd be hungry. He understood what it was to be human. He had been out working all day, came in one day, and he said, hey, what do you got to eat? Man, I'm hungry. Isn't that just like a real man? Jesus was a real man. He understood. I believe Jesus craved human friendship. Now, don't believe for a second all the stories that, that you saw in some of the movies that had put out later that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. That's just a sheer bunch of lies. But I believe that he did crave friendship. I think he was a lonesome man. He never complained about it. But there are times when the curtain is pulled aside and we can get a glimpse of a lonely man, Jesus. Maybe in a time like that, a rich young man comes up to him and says, Master, I think you're going to make it. You're going to build this into something really big. You're going to have a lot of followers. There'll be a lot of people wanting to contribute, a lot of money coming in. You're going to need a treasurer. I'm a CPA. Let me be your treasurer. I'll help you. His name was Judas. Maybe it was a time like that when Jesus said, you know, the birds of the air, they have their nests. Foxes, they have their holes. But the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. Sounds like a lonely man to me. And he's saying, Judas, don't follow me because of what you think you're going to get here. You need to follow me because of what's up there. And then, my favorite thing, maybe being an evangelist, that's why. Jesus was a hard burden preacher. He had a passion for his mission. He had a passion, burning fire inside for his message. One day he's coming in with the disciples. There's the city of Jerusalem. They're looking at it out there, outstretched, and finally Jesus gets quiet, like he's pondering something. He says, Look, I want you to go to this address in town. There's a broken coat, unbroken coat there, a donkey. Go get it. Bring it back. Well, they couldn't wait for that. 
They dashed into town. They knew the prophecy in Zechariah that said the Son of Man, the Messiah, would, would ascend to the throne of David riding on the back of an unbroken colt. So they ran in the town to get that donkey. They thought, now, finally. They couldn't understand Jesus. They believed Him. They trusted Him. They believed He was the Messiah. But they never could understand, why doesn't He act like it? Because, see, their view of the Messiah was one who would be a, a military leader that would build Israel into a mighty nation and crush the yoke of Roman oppression. And Jesus, all he did was go around healing people and forgiving sins. When is he going to be the Messiah? When is he going to act like the Messiah? Now, now is the time. They ran into town. They found that donkey. They brought him back to Jesus. And in undeveloped countries, it's amazing how rapidly the news gets out. Everybody knows what's going on. They're all gathered together on the outskirts of town. Jesus is there riding on that donkey. And there are the disciples. They're all pressed tightly against him. They're the inner circle. In fact, they had been fighting over who's going to be first in his kingdom. So they're pressing against Jesus. They wanted everybody to see that they were there. They were the inner circle. They were going to be the vice president, secretary of state, secretary of defense, treasurer. They wanted everybody to see them. And Jesus is going. The crowd's gathering. They're taking off their cloaks. They're bringing palm branches. They're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the Messiah, Jesus, finally ascending to the throne of David, finally acting like the Messiah. The whole city is there. When suddenly Jesus stops, the singing stops, and it's so quiet you can hear a pin drop. CNN is there with 150 microphones sticking them in his face <laughs> because they want to get that kingly proclamation. People standing on their tiptoes wanting to catch a glimpse of that kingly expression on his face. Disciples pressing tightly. They're the inner circle. But nobody saw a kingly expression. They saw tears. Nobody heard a kingly proclamation. All they heard was Jesus saying, Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. How many times I would gather you in like a mother hen gathers her baby chicks. But you won't come. Hard, burdened preacher. Tears in his eyes as he looks at the rich young man who walked away because he was afraid it would cost him too much to follow Jesus. Tears welling up in his eyes as he sees the young teenage girl afraid of what her friends might think. But she joined with this bunch. Hard burdened preacher. He loved even those Pharisees standing out on the outer edge with their arms folded. He loved them. And he died for them. Finally, the crowd left. Jesus told the disciples, go and meet me in the upper room. Place is prepared there for the Lord's Supper. So they went, and there was nobody there, just the disciples. All the preparation has been made. Everything was in place. The only problem was that there was no servant there to wash their feet. There was a table, basin, put water in, a pitcher of water, and a towel there, but no servant to wash their feet. And Jesus is coming. They hear him walking down the hall. Now remember, they've been fighting over who's going to be first in the kingdom. So when Jesus comes in and there's no servant there, they're scared to death. He's going to ask one of them to do it. And if he asks one of them to do it, that means they would be at the bottom of the list instead of the top. So they're not looking up. They're looking down at the floor. When that door opened, they're turned the other way. Because Jesus might catch a glimpse of one of them and tell them, come wash our feet. But they didn't hear anything. And they turned to look out of the corner of their eye. They couldn't believe what they saw. There was Jesus, sinless Son of God, God, taking off his outer robe, walking over to the table, Pick up the towel, wrap it around his waist, dump the water in the basin, and 
began to wash their feet. Wow. What a God. One by one, even Judas was there. He had already betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and Jesus washed his feet. Later on, he couldn't take it. Later on, after he fled from the room, he went out and hung himself. The disciples celebrated the Lord's Supper with Jesus. Must have been an event. Love to have been there. Afterwards, they sang a hymn. They went out, walked through the city, out the eastern gate, across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was strangely quiet, maybe even groaning a little bit as though he was carrying a heavy load. Disciples weren't saying anything. They got to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus told the disciples, I want you to stay here and pray. Just stay here and pray. Peter, James, and John, you come with me. And so they came, and then he stopped again. He said, I want you to stay here and pray. Just pray. And then they watched Jesus as he walked up the pathway in the Garden of Gethsemane. They could see him in the moonlight filtering down through the olive trees. And finally he stopped and fell heavily to the ground. And he began to pray. And the disciples heard him. They said, Father, he said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, let your will be done. Let this cup pass if there's any other way. You see, Jesus did not want to go up that hill to Calvary. He didn't want to die on the cross. If there's any other way, Father, please. But there was no other way. Then, not my will, let your will be done. What were these strange words coming from the lips of Jesus? The one whose will had always been one with the Father, and now he's saying, not my will, let your will be done? You'd think the disciples would have suspected something of an unusual magnitude was happening that night, and that they would have been alert, and they would have been praying, but the Bible says they fell asleep. Jesus came back and shook them. Can't you pray for just an hour? That's all. Just an hour? When was the last time you prayed for just an hour? Then he went back, fell to the ground again. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, let your will be done. Three times they fell asleep. They didn't understand what was happening that night. They didn't understand that Jesus was taking in his own body the guilt for their sins, for your sins, mine. They didn't realize that Jesus was feeling the weight of the sins of the world and they were crushing his life. And he would have died right there if it hadn't have been for an angel coming to strengthen him. It wasn't time for Jesus to die yet. No. He had to be tried as a common criminal, dressed in a purple robe, stick in his hand, crown of thorns, slammed on his head, mocked as king of the Jews, knocked down, beat till his back was raw and bleeding, kicked, spit on, stood up again, beat some more. He had to have that heavy cross thrust on his shoulders and carry it up the hill to Calvary. He had to be stretched out on those rough boards. He had to have the Roman soldiers pick up the heavy hammers, the big nails, and drive them into his hands, the same hands that had reached out and healed 
healed and touched and loved. And now they're nailing them to the old rugged cross. It wasn't time for him to die yet. He had to be lifted up like a snake on a pole and dropped into that hole with a sickening thud that racked his pain, his body with pain. No, it wasn't time for him to die yet. He had to be hanging up there, a spectacle to the universe, the emblem of sin. Guilty for the sins of the world. The Bible tells us the pain of crucifixion was beyond human endurance. Some of you saw the movie and you saw the beatings with the chains and the pain and the torture that he went through on the cross, but I want to tell you something. That wasn't the real passion of Christ. I don't even know that he felt the chains. I don't know that he felt the beating because of the pain in his heart when his own disciples fled. And the words of Peter ringing in his ear, I don't know that cursed man. I don't know that he felt the physical pain because of the pain in his heart, a broken heart, because of the ones he loved so much that abandoned him. I don't know that he felt the physical pain because as he hung on the cross like a serpent on a pole, the emblem of sin, bearing our sins, he was made to be sin for us. He realized that his heavenly Father, so holy and so pure, couldn't even bear to look on the awful spectacle, turning his face causing him to feel in his own heart the separation that sin brings between man and God, causing him to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For the first time in eternity, he felt the distance from his Father. And then he hung his head and died for you. Me. He would have done it if looking down through the ages he could see that you would be the only one, the only one that would ever follow him. He would have done it for you. Now that story isn't over yet. Because one day soon the heavens are going to open and he's going to come again not wearing a crown of thorns, but a crown of glory. Follow the Lamb. He won.